Hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you. My name is Glenn Adamson, and I am the host of Design and Dialogue. It's a great pleasure to welcome John Hoke to the program today. This interview is pre-recorded, so you won't be able to ask uh, John any questions, but we do have two of his colleagues from Nike with us as well. So we had the pleasure of being joined by Sarah Janji from Design Communications, and also Nick Schoenberger, who is Senior Director of Narrative Storytelling for Nike. John, of course, is the design guy at Nike, uh, and is, he's going to be telling us all about his approach to design futures uh, with the company. So many interesting topics to touch on, and he'll also be giving us a little bit of his own story, and the, of course the powerful legacy of Nike uh, that he's uh, joined relatively recently in the grand scheme of things, and is carrying on into tomorrow. John, welcome to Design and Dialogue. Glenn, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you and your audience. I've got a chance to see several of your interviews and um, I consider myself uh, grateful to be a part of the wonderful lineup that you've spoken to. Um, design is at a pivotal point in the world today. So I, um, I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to talk about some of the things that, that we've done at Nike and some of the experiences that I've had as a as a designer myself, and maybe get into the future, because I think that's the thing that, you know, I'm very fixated on, which is, um, where is this all going? And how do we as designers and creatives and artists kind of use the moment that we're in today to um, find a, a new space, a next era um, for all of us, because I think that's going to be central to our humanity and our civilization. So that um, I'll spend time on that. Awesome. Well said. Um, before we kick off with images, John, can I just ask you where you're sitting right now? You look like you're in Nike Universe, but I'm not sure if that means you're on campus or at home. Uh, I, good call. I'm at the Nike Universe. This is uh, our world headquarters, and we are situated in Beaverton, Oregon, which is roughly nine miles to the west of downtown Portland, Oregon. And, and this is our corporate, uh, our offices. And I'm today I'm sitting in my, my corporate office up on um, the Nike executive floor and not everyone's back because of COVID. So I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be here. I spent most of the past year alone. Uh, hence why I have my friend Wilson over here. <laughs> Keeps me company uh, on my island in, in Nike world. But um, we can't wait to have our full staff rejoin us. Um, and they're coming back to work at the office space where I personally have been aching to have that uh, that experience again. And uh, just one little quick uh, product placement moment. I see you've got a copy of the new book with you, so I have mine here. So oh, this good. is this is the great new book, which is um, published by Fade and uh, Nike. Better is temporary, and you see it just sitting there on the shelf next to John as well. So if you want to hear or see more about the story that you're about to uh, experience from directly from John's mouth. Uh, I highly, highly recommend that book. It's a really important new publication in the field. So, uh, but with that, John, shall we go ahead and start looking at some images? We will. I'm uh, just, as we dive in, I'm, I'm incredibly proud of that work that our team and um, at Nike and Sam Rue and, and Fido and Press have done. Um, we're, we're lucky because we have uh, a 50 year legacy of design that I'll talk about briefly, but I think it's really well captured in that, in that book because it captures not just the work, but the ethic and the theory and the commitment that we have as a company. You know, 50 years later, to be thinking about design and innovation in a similar fashion when we started, um, that's incredible. So I, you know, I often say we're a 50 year startup we're still learning from the beginning. So with that, I'll dive into, I'm gonna share my screen, Glenn. If I can get to you. All right, can you, can you see my screen? Uh, we can, thank you. All right, all right. That's the, that's the way we talk in Zoom, just to make sure things are, are out there. Okay, so I've entitled this uh, talk, Better is Temporary. And one of the things I've learned in my nearly 30 year career at Nike is that athletes in sports are always trying to push boundaries and break records and, and push on barriers. And, and I've learned that for 30 years. 
just like in sports, the same thing is true in design. As soon as we're done designing something, um, it's temporary. We want to keep pushing on that design, evolving it, making it better and better over time. I've got three quick chapters. I've got an origin chapter, how I found design. I've got a quick chapter on the legacy of power of 50 years of Nike design innovation. And then the last one is a focus on how we're advancing human potential uh, today and into the future. So let's go to the first slide. So my journey um, is, is pretty quick. Um, I, I always start by saying I'm dyslexic. So my first true language was drawing. It's how I negotiated and navigated the world. I was also an athlete. And so I love to move and play sports. And I'm lucky to have found a career where I blended my artistic ability, my design ability, and my athletic interests, et cetera. As a young kid floating on a raft one day, I thought to myself, what if I shrank this raft and I put it under my foot? I was running with the older boys in cross country, studying their sneakers, studying their movement. I took that idea home. I started drawing that. My father was an engineer and I said, I've got this idea. And he said, kind of cool. What do you want to do with it? I ended up sending it to Nike. Two weeks later, uh, a package shows up, a letter. The letter on the left is basically, hey, cool idea. We're working on some fun stuff like this. Love, love the thinking. The letter on the right is the letter I received back when I got my job offer from Nike. And I love the last line from my first boss, Gordon Thompson. Now get out here and start drawing because drawing was a way we understand the problem sets of athletes. Next slide. Um, before coming to Nike and before going to graduate school, uh, I was trying to figure out how I was going to negotiate the world around me. I, I wasn't a good test taker. I didn't do well in school, being dyslexic. And my, my parents didn't want me to go to art school. They thought I would starve. So I decided to go to architecture school. And I recall going to Falling Water, Frank Lloyd Wright's you know, epic masterpiece outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And coming from the suburbs of Philadelphia, this was a head snap. This was something I'd never seen before. The, the poetry, the beauty, the, the essence of space, the challenge of these trays hovering over this crackling waterfall, listening and hearing and being about and for nature. Absolutely breathtaking. So I arced towards architecture school. I went to Penn State as an artistic merit uh, scholar, was able to graduate. And I quickly came out of school and was lucky enough to find a job working for Michael Graves. Um, I'll tell you the story briefly here. I was really searching for a design studio that was thinking parametrically, literally designing cities, buildings, rooms, spaces, chairs, and tabletop, and everything in between. I started as a model maker, Glenn, and that was probably the lowest on the totem pole. But I worked my way up and at the tender age of 22, 23, I was designing things like spaces in the Swan and Dolphin Hotel at the Epcot Center and the rooms and the environment and the items in accoutrement like LSA and other things. And so it was important for me to find a career where I could express myself in these multiple scales. Next slide. Hey, actually, John, can I just stop you there for one second because Michael Graves is of such great interest for me as a design historian, and of course for many people now who look uh, back to him as such an uh, inspiring figure. He's also, of course, associated with the very problematic and controversial term postmodernism, and in many ways is taken almost as the American representative of that style. I'm wondering what your vantage point on that idea is. I guess both I'm asking, do you actually buy the idea that Michael Graves was a postmodernist? And also, do you think the ideas that were circulating in postmodern discourse in the 1980s, let's say, when you would have been associated with him. Did that have any long-term impact on your own design thinking? Yeah, great question. So I think the label of postmodernism and him being a, a forefather of postmodernism was probably something that irked Mr. Graves. I mean, I think he, he began his career as a true modernist coming out of Harvard and studying under uh, Gropius and, and studying the Cabousier language and, and really having that be his foray. You know, I think he came to this expression through his uh, Rome Prize travels, the Grand Tour, going to, going to Italy. And what he fell in love with in Italy was the tectonics of architecture, the, the known spaces of, of foyer, of entry, of vestibule, of, of um, sort of a, a a processional thought of what architecture was. 
And he did bring back with him clearly ornamentation and, and color. And, you know, I think he was a master at trying to breathe life into these two, these two ideas. One is a modernity, which is uh, about the future. And at the same time, pulling some of the reverence of the past and reintroducing that to the public. Um, I don't believe that the generalized expression of postmodernism in, this, in America was at all well done. I think it was proliferated uh, very sloppily and very lazily. So that, that, of course, is not an American architecture, that the origin of this came from really caring about spaces and places and placemaking. You know, for, my, for me personally, I think the thing that I, I found um, incredibly powerful working with, with Graves was his attention to massing, his attention to detail, his attention to uh, the poetry of space and how you bring ritual into objects, uh, whether that be cities or teaspoons. That's fascinating because it, it suggests to me that um, well, let me put it this way. I think for the casual observer hearing that you were at Michael Graves and then became uh, such a leading figure in design at Nike, the obvious thing to focus on would be like the procession of the image, which a lot of postmodern theorists talked about. But I think your point about ritual and the kind of heightening of experiences may be more to the point now. Yeah, I mean, I think there was truly an empathic view of, of how, how do you create a series of engagements and experience with the vehicle of architecture and the creation of a room and the dynamics of a room and the place inside the room, not unlike Frank Lloyd Wright, which was kind of a total design, right? So how, how do you help script um, an approach into understanding the, the tectonics of making and, and imagery and, and an experience? And so there, he, he claimed himself to be a humanism, uh, humanist. And he used humanism to try to take back some of the what he felt was the lacking um, aspects of, of modernity, which was uh, too cold, too severe, and not of the human, of the machine. So I think this notion of turning back towards how can these places be more for humans was quite interesting. Awesome. Okay. Well, we could talk about graves all day. <laughs> it would be great to do that, but let's carry on with your story. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that really, I went to Mike, I spent time at Michael Graves. I went back to graduate school and uh, then I came to Nike. And one of the things about Nike was that we have an amazing legacy of innovation and design. Two fundamental characters, uh, our co-founder, Bill Bowerman, in the foreground of the black and white photo, and then Steve Prefontaine, rock star athlete, runner. And what this does to me personally, this signifies this unique distinctive partnership between an inventor, a designer, a craftsperson, and an athlete. And partnered together, uh, these two changed the face of track and field because they changed the way they approached the equipment, the training, uh, the regimen that is pushing boundaries and barriers of records. Bowerman had tons of championships. Steve Prefontaine held tons of records. Together, they were iconic. And this is the, the essence and the life's blood of this partnership uh, between an athlete and a coach. Bill was an interesting character, um, not a classic designer. Uh, he was actually a professor at the University of Oregon and of course the track coach. He, he liked to say that he was the professor of competitive response and everything he did was focused on giving an athlete a little advantage, an incremental shift, a, a small change. Some of the products you see on the right are him literally hand building these sneakers, these spikes for his athletes, everyone different because everyone was empathically designed for the unique athletes. Next slide. He, he was relentless. He was a tinker. This is a photograph of uh, Bill in his garage, which I got a chance to go to. Um, he was up many nights, many evenings, many weekends tinkering away obsessed with how he could make improvements, obsessed with what he could do with his files and chisels and uh, tools around him to make minor modifications for each athlete to help them find their greatness. Next slide. 
Really great example here on the left, you see Steve Prefontaine's racing flat. Um, and funny enough, you can actually see some residue on the toe bumper in the outsole where Steve would use duct tape to give a little bit of extra containment in that shoe. On the outsole, you see the classic Nike waffle outsole, which was designed to basically have traction and cushioning combined with rubber. The relic on the right is a well-used breakfast appliance which was a waffle iron. Uh, Bill selected the waffle irons from his wife Barbara's kitchens over and over again and poured rubber into these waffle irons, testing, experimenting, exploring. Uh, I had a chance to help Bill uh, move. We found dozens of these in the basement because he was ruining these over and over again. Classic hacking of design, hacking into appliances and materials and finding new ways and new geometries to eventually create the iconic waffle outsole. Next slide. And by the way, um, how, how interesting is that in the, this slide is uh, very apt that the kind of uh, customization that he was doing with the athletes is in anticipation of what you're doing now with digital technology. I mean, we'll get to that, but it's really worth pointing out that that um, attentiveness to the individual athletes incremental needs is you were saying just a little better every time it's really still in the lifeblood of the design ethos of the company and the best part about that now glenn is you know this effort with bill and his athletes was bespoke to a handful of people the future it is a scalable approach to be bespoke to everyone so unique as your fingerprint will be the products that work with you uh, this slide just shows you know the commitment from bill Bowerman and Steve Prefontaine, which becomes the, the bedrock of Nike's NSRL, our, our science research lab, is we test athletes. We want to know as much as we possibly can about these athletes, and, and we want to study the, the intricate, specific, minute details that when you add them all together, they create um, greatness and they help break records, etc. So uh, this exists today. Another important part of what Nike design does and Nike innovation is a part of is experimentation. We have a restless uh, disregard for the status quo. We push on convention. That's, that's not something we wanna follow. We wanna test it, we wanna challenge it. So case in point, this is a Cortez shoe, somebody experimenting with a really thick outsole. So how can we make that outsole and midsole unit be cushioning for the athlete? So that bold radical experimentation exists even today. Yeah, it's so true because it almost looks like a sculpture <laughs> the shoe compared to what you're used to. And it's that, sort of, that idea of the shoe can kind of look like anything. It doesn't have to look like what the last one did, but just a little bit different, right? It's, it's, it's 40 years old. I love this side by side. This is, uh, these are two letters from two running athletes. On the left is Steve Prefontaine, 1971. On the right is uh, Kipchoge, one of our lead marathon runners. Both are drawing their shoes as a doodle. Both are annotating. On the left, it's saying, hey, Bill, fix these things. Because if you don't fix these things, I can't achieve my greatness. On the right, uh, Kipchoge saying the same thing to us. These things don't work. Adjust these things. And so it's that unique partnership that we are designing and innovating uh, in concert with our athletes, because that's what nets us unique wonderful innovations. John, can I ask you a question? Um, of course, the other co-founder of uh, Nike was Nick Knight, who was the kind of business guy. And uh, along with Bowerman, he produced this incredible company. And as you're saying, Bowerman, who in some ways is almost your predecessor, um, although I realized the company structure is so much more complicated now than it was in those days. And one way of interpreting Bowerman's role is that he was the guy who was talking to both the athletes and to Nick Knight and the rest of the company that was thinking of itself really as an entrepreneurial concern. And I wonder if you also understand your role as that of a hinge between the absolute needs of the athletes and I suppose also the consumers that are more uh, you know, amateur or non-athletes um, on the one hand and then if you like the business side of the company, do you feel like you're a kind of key point of communication or transmission of ideas between those two different worlds? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Glenn, my quick answer is absolutely. Um, I'm a bridge and I 
believe, um, I like to say that I have an ambidextrous mind. I'm right brain and left brain. Uh, and the power of those is not just bold ideas, but bold ideas that, that get completed and that move into the marketplace and change and make markets in a very different way. And, you know, the, 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 the true trifecta of, of Nike is uh, Bill Bowerman, the, the tinker, the innovator, Steve Prefontaine, the, the spirit of our company, the, the rebel athlete, and Phil Knight, the entrepreneur. And, and those three together and, and their energy have created what is the destiny today. And, and those lessons and that energy and that collaboration exists right now and should for some time. It's a, for, a fantastic formula. Great, okay, well, let's look at the next slide. So, you know, I'm sh I've been showing you bits about the past. These are bits about the future, uh, well, the present and the future. So the tools are changing, right? And we, of course, we still sketch, but we are at the dawn of a brand new age, an age of computational generative design and manufacturing. And we have more information now, more data sets that come into our design staff than is, uh, it's hard to fathom. One thing we know for sure, Glenn, is that data can't dream. It is, it just is. So designers convert that data and that information into wild, their wild imagination. They solve problems. And so whether the tool is um, a three-dimensional printer or a mo-cap opportunity with our athletes, we're using the latest technologies to go deeper and farther into studying athletes. Next slide. And that just continues the partnership at the next level. So think of Kipchoge. He, and the example I wanted to use was uh, Kipchoge was trying to break the sub two hour marathon barrier, literally un, un, unthinkable, unheard of, uh, much akin to the sub four hour, I'm sorry, four minute mile. We worked with Kipchoge, his ambition, his desire. Let's go to the next slide. And we had a, designed a product we called the Vaporfly 4%. This is the combination of working with this athlete unique. This is unique to him. We've basically reassigned and reassembled and reimagined foam, carbon, and fly knit, unique to him. So placed exactly where he needs it, precisely designed to his foot, more aerodynamic, more efficiency. And this product uh, at the first outing in Monza got really close. And I think, as you know, he's actually broken through that two hour um, barrier, which again was un unheard of. So that this is an example of where we're pushing the idea of advancing the potential and progression of sport, not just for elite athletes, but for every single athlete. And now more to the point, every athlete in the planet. Next slide. Which leads me to this, this basic statement that we're here to advance human potential. Um, that's who we are, that's who we've been, that's who we'll be. There are three areas that I want to just quickly highlight. One is inclusivity, inviting more to sport. Two is sustainability, uh, the circular design destiny. And the last one is quantum creativity. The future is high powered calculus partnered with high powered human imagination. So let's see the first one. I've got two examples of inclusivity. This is Nike Project Victory Swim. Um, this is a project we put into the market about two years ago. Uh, the problem was there was a certain uh, athlete who couldn't get in the water and be athletic. Um, they required modesty. The solution for modesty was a bulky uh, cotton, almost burlap sack, which when they got in the water, they couldn't actually swim. In fact, it was dangerous. So next slide. We actually took a chance to work with these athletes and understand by using hydrophobic material, it sheds water, designing it in layers. So think about the way the athletes are moving through the water with more grace and power and literally inviting uh, a whole, a whole uh, aspect of athletes who could not be athletic in the water to come to water sports and to use that as a vehicle uh, to find their greatness and find their own, their own personal destiny, destiny in terms of athleticism. So that's one. one. Can I throw you a question at you on this one, John? Um, obviously, there's so much to talk about in this case, and I'm very familiar with it because it was nominated for the Design of the Year when I was curating that show at the London Design Museum. So I remember thinking a lot about it at the time. And one of the things that struck me was 
you know, this is such a political minefield, questions of veiling and modesty among Muslim communities, critiques of that same set of practices is particularly hot in France, that debate, um, I remember at the time. And I remember thinking, you know, design is a very unusual way to cut through this because, you know, if you're a swimmer, you just have to have a way to do this, right? It's not a political question at all. And I wonder whether you felt being so directly involved with this and seeing the company's involvement, and I'm sure a lot of noise came back at you um, probably on all sides of the question as well, whether you felt that design was ultimately um, almost the best premise that you had for having touched on something that, that was that sensitive. How did you feel about it at the time? How do you look back at it now? I'm proud of the work. Um, you know, the, the communities that are, are underserved in regard to being invited to sports um, is not something we stand for. I mean, we, we believe that sport is a birthright for every generation and anyone. And where there are deserts to sport or barriers to sport, those become problems for us to solve. In regard to modesty, you know, of course there are specific um, religious parameters that were a part of this project, but this was also about, you know, people who were interested in being more body conscious or less body conscious and having more freedom and flexibility of choices and or afraid of um, or concerned about the sun. So it, it wasn't one particular group. It was just this idea that there are choices for people to swim. And where there wasn't a choice, there needed to be a choice made. And you know, we, we are evolving this program, of course, and we're learning a ton from it um, by, by, by the athletes giving us feedback, which is, goes back to the, the premise of the company. There's also something very interesting there about um, choice as itself being a kind of ethical principle. And I realize this cuts both ways because sometimes people will critique capitalism at large or specific companies for, you know, constantly offering too much choice and, you know, it becoming almost like a hall of mirrors for the consumer. But the other way of looking at it is that the more choice you give, the more individuals can find their own needs met. And it seems like particularly in sports and design, that's a particularly important criterion. Yeah. I think if we, you know, we, we widen the aperture blend to, um, a deeper set of problems beyond this country. Um, there are there are problems out there to be solved, and and ath athletics and sport is is not uniquely American. It, it's uniquely human, and so for us, the chance to to find what those problem sets are and to evolve evolve our solutions to invite more to sport, we're, we're doing um, what I believe is the right thing. Um, speaking of um, involving or bringing more to sport, um, we'll go back to that guy right there. This is uh, a project we just dropped um, not too long ago. It's the Nike Go Fly Ease. And this is a project uh, under the genre of Fly Ease, which is thinking about athletes or consumers who may have a difficult time using traditional laced shoes. Uh, using their hands. And this is a step-in product. So think about on the right, the product is, is hinged open. You step into the product and you close it. So completely hands-free. So this opens up the aperture and brings an invitation to even more people participating in sports. I've used this shoe. I've run the shoe. It's a fantastic running product with no compromises. Yeah, this is such a great example too of how sometimes design constraint can just produce fantastic results because i i mean this to me is one of the more fashion forward pieces of footwear you're likely to encounter it's like the opposite of the you know orthopedic shoe that looks like a punishment that's been applied to the person you know and there's a there's an intuitive nature to this glenn with the way this hinge is designed where it just it breaks it breaks the form vocabulary of a traditional shoe and i think it's it's that break that is the invitation for a deeper gaze. What is going on here? How can I use this? And I can tell you using it, the, the in-shoe experience and feel is there's nothing like it. So the last section quickly is um, sustainability. And I believe uh, circularity is destiny for design. I'll spotlight a project that's well-known in the sneaker community. This was a collaboration with 
uh, Mark Newsom back in the early 2000s uh, called the ZDOC issue. Let's lift the slide, please. And what Mark and our team were able to do is basically rethink the way shoes are produced. On the left is the complete composition with the rubber cage that wrapped around the foot. On the right, you see the complete components of this product. There are four. Typical sneakers can have 20 to 50 components and they all have to be put together. Mark and the team began to think about four. The cage using geometry, not chemistry, housed the booty. The booty sat on top of the cushioning and it snapped into the outsole. A revolutionary way to make a mold and think about how products are assembled together without adhesives. So this was a great individual shoe from Mark and Nike. Uh, roll the next slide, please. And we were able to take this as an impetus idea and begin to create something we called considered design in the mid 2000s. Three products. The goal here was to leverage the snap fitting, no adhesives, better choices of materials. But the goal also here was to make this product designed for disassembly. When the product was done, you could take it apart very easily and put it back into streams that we could recapture and reimagine over time. Okay. You know, the, I, I wanted to stop just for a second on this one because this is so fascinating. I mean, look at the date, 2005 and Mark Newson even a year earlier. But this one in particular, you know, the idea of local sourcing, for example. So I know the materials, for example, were gathered within a 200 mile radius of the Thailand based factories, for example. And uh, again, it pushes the look into a space that at that time, I think, especially would have seemed truly surprising to a lot of folks thinking about what Nike was about. And um, I sort of feel like this project maybe it was ahead of its time um, and more of a kind of prescient project rather than something that actually uh, scaled up at, at, in its moment. But I, I wonder to what extent you feel like this uh, particular initiative considered actually opened up doors in the company to do the kind of work that you're in fact still doing now and how, you, how it's looked back on in the company generally. Yeah, I mean, I, I would tell you it was a springboard working directly with our manufacturing and supply base, how we actually source materials, the way we consider bringing the products um, to life, literally building them was a head snap and a complete change with our, our supply base. And, and, and that's one side, but the other side, Glenn, was it, it challenged our designers to think beyond the bounds of the way conventional shoes have been made. And that in some of those conventions, they're, they're not positive. So how do we go back in and leverage some of this new learning and begin to think as a designer, um, the complete spectrum of building, using and loving, and then decommissioning and disassembling and, and reusing. And so that, that begins that circular idea. And I think this was a, a clear lighthouse product within Nike that has got us to where we are today. And of course, our latest iteration last year was Space Hippie. Um, this is you know, a well-known product. We're really proud of this because this was uh, a challenge for us uh, our design innovation teams, they have a great, a great quote where uh, there's no resupply mission to the planet. So we have to work with the materials that we have. And Space Hippie is a foray into collecting factory scraps, but then blending them with post-consumer uh, opportunities and scraps. And so that's our first step towards an upcycling, fully circular opportunity. I could also tell you that the in-shoe experience and the use of this product is fantastic. There are no compromises, right? This, it has a unique look and a texture to it, but the in-shoe experience, whether you're running or just you know, training in this product, it's as good as anything we've ever done. And it begins to announce to the world, uh, we're serious as a, as a company taking a position on um, citizen athletes needing citizen designers to think the entire value stream through from sourcing to manufacturing, to shipping, to usage, to returning. Um, this is the beginning. You'll see lots of other things coming, Glenn, that push on this so that we can think about making matter matter even more by taking it back and then reimagining it over and over and over again. Yeah, this seems like such an important project, John. And um, I guess one question that comes to mind for me is whether uh, the visual rhetoric here, because you know, even the the name with hippie in the in the title, but also the um, the stylistic features of the shoe 
which communicate this idea of ecology. So it's not hidden, but rather very much worn proudly on the surface of the design. Whether you feel like, um, I guess this is like a moment whose time has come where the public is ready to accept something that has this kind of look and this kind of ideology or, or ethic built into it. Like, do you feel like there was an open space there, like a truck sized open space that you were driving into or how much, how much uh, do you feel like public opinion had made it possible for you to do this? Well, you know, we have a history of putting objects from the future on the table that are avant-garde or grotesque. And what I mean is without, without reference, there's no reference to this. So what I saw the public respond to was there is an, an innate beauty in the roughness of the hand of these products. And that beauty is assembled in ways that we're basically saying trash is gold. It's just a matter of how you see it. And we're asking you to gaze a little bit further into this solution. And the more time spent with these products, the more people smiled because they saw and felt this connection to not just the item, but to the theory and to the approach we're taking all the way down to our factory partners. I love your use of the term avant-garde there because it also strikes me that uh, of everything in this deck, this is the object that most looks like something you might see at Friedman Benda, the gallery, you know? And it, it really suggests the idea that there's, maybe it's also the age of the internet that aesthetics start to congeal and uh, you know, cohere in ways that they hadn't previously, but it does feel like it's simultaneously a very successful commercial product and also kind of an artwork at the same time. And you don't have to choose between the two. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the beautiful things about this piece is that it strikes all those chords. And, you know, a part of this is, is also continuously introducing to the public a conversation around beauty and a conversation around aesthetic. And, and moving that dialogue along for the next generation and the generation beyond that. So, you know, we're not a company who wants to rest on our laurels. We're a company in pursuit, pursuit of the new and, and the challenging. And I think that this expression uh, did a great job announcing a, a pivot and announcing a, a new vocabulary for our company. So better is temporary. <laughs> um, okay, let's go on to the, just a couple more uh Couple more. Yeah. This is, uh, I hope we have the Tokyo Olympics here in two months. I'll make this really quick. The, these products are made from 100% recycled polyester and nylon, whether it's the competitive kit on the field, you see the USA track and field kit or the metal stand. There's marker efficiency, there's reuse product with no compromises. And so there is this inherent understanding or misunderstanding that a sustainable product is less than it's got somehow compromised. It doesn't have to be. And we're challenging and pushing on that understanding. Um, that was great. I'm really glad you did it quickly. But I do want to ask you to explain zero marker because it's so interesting from a design point of view. So as I understand it, it has to do with the efficiency with which the pattern cutting is delivered to create the eventual product, correct? That's right. So if you think about the piece on the right, which is our metal stand, um, this, is, this is a material that is stamped out of a sheet. And a sheet comes in certain parameters, X and Y. Um, traditionally, in apparel, you would cut out a pattern from a series of patterns, and it'd be a waste, a waste doily, if you will. Uh, this is designed with almost no waste. So we're taking the we're taking the square sheet, and we're folding it, and we're adjusting it, and shaping it without losing the material. So from an efficiency perspective, we're using all the material, and from a look and feel perspective, it has a different drape but it's elegant and it's beautiful and it's tailored on the left this is a knit material so this is knitting is 100 percent. when you're done you just you just cut it off the machine so there's nothing going in the waste stream so both of these using recycled materials putting less waste into the system is exactly the point I love that too because, of course, knitting historically you think of as a you think of it as a handcraft and maybe like a cottage industry. And also, one of the reasons it was used in that context, even in the 18th century, was precisely because, as you say, there was no waste at a time when textile materials were obviously much more expensive. It's fascinating that we're kind of getting back to that almost primordial craft situation, but in this super high tech way in service of sustainability. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and then um, okay, last section real quickly is. As we think about advancing uh, human potential, 
I, I am fascinated with the notion of quantum creativity. Real quickly, as I think about that, it is data sets, inputs and outputs of new technologies, new calculus, new, new programs, advanced technologies combined with the human imagination, the human emotion, the human design, hand and heart. Those two things together, um, I believe are the future. Case in point, this is a shoe, a uh, spike we did for an athlete in 2016. This shoe runs the 200 meter. That goes around a loop and a track. The left shoe and the right shoe are designed to be different because the role of your left foot and right foot are different rounding a current. So this shoe is designed uniquely to this athlete's foot. It's right for her and the spoke. And the outsole was three-dimensionally printed very differently left to right and began to tell us that we can go even more hyper-specific to our athletes. Next slide. So that's the spirit of Bowerman and LaFont and uh, Prefontaine very much back, back in action, right? Back in action. And then the craft of what we can do, the, the level of fidelity, the level of pushing the output technologies making those products fine-tuned and precise to exactly what the athlete is doing and needing and wanting from our products. Uh, we've never had more control. I'm talking at a nano level. Like we're not, this is not a gesture anymore. This is the sum of all the parts being put together. For a designer, you've got, you've got computational control over everything. And that's what we seek. And if we do this well, to the next slide, what we're doing is we're putting this on an athlete Unique, unique to his needs, exactly what he needs for this run in this environment on this surface. And we can fine tune with precision to make that unique to that moment. Last slide. So what I love is that um, we're in really early innings here. This, we're in our infancy of blending uh, two AIs, an artificial intelligence powered by calculus and powered by technology, combined with Nike Design's unique audacious imagination. Those two things blended together, that's gonna to be the future for us. Bold new white spaces, new gestures, new performance, new utility, new aesthetics. Which leads me to the end. All that is really here. That for us at Nike for 50 years and 50 years going forward, I believe that the pursuit is everything. We're never done. Our athletes will push and we will push with them, which gets us back to the idea that there truly is no finish line in sports. Well, that was awesome. Thank you so much, John. Amazing. So many ideas there. Um, I have a couple of questions that I wanted to ask and I know your colleagues had a couple of ideas they wanted to throw out as well. Um, one is just on that last point about computational design and what you're calling quantum creativity, really interesting phrase. And I know you've also talked about quantum craftsmanship in the past of, again, bringing together the extremes of what we may consider technology to offer. And the question I had for you was about AI and whether you can see your own role changing because of the possibilities of AI, where you become more of like an orchestrator of creative tools rather than um, maybe feeling the creativity in as direct a way as you did in the past, or certainly Bowerman would have done in the 70s? Yeah, yeah, awesome question. Um, I've, got, I've got quite a few things to say. I'll, I'll try to chunk it down to, to uh, the most salient points. Um, I, I actually believe that design is changing. The, the, the practicing of design, the discipline of design is changing uh, for the better. Um, the technologies that I see coming are incredibly impressive and powerful. And while they are powerful, they're still tools and tools need to be wielded and used and mastered. Um, the way I see my role now is I truly am a conductor, a conductor of problems, of materials, of technologies, all, all in service of trying to create something unique and distinctive and, and advancing the, the opportunities of athletes and the performance of athletes. But now more than ever, design is about parameters being understood and leveraging data and leveraging the technology to iterate very fastly in, in a way that's um, un, un, hard to understand what the pace is. But the human hand and the human eye and the human heart 
are still in control because the computer today can't understand the poetry of how something looks and feels on the body, etc. So we still have that critical creative eye that needs to be employed. It has to. But as a surrogate, as a partner to us, to crunch through and uh, literally iterative ideas, you know, I'll, I'll speak to myself as a designer many years ago. I could iterate probably half a dozen ideas because that's all I could handle because you're, you're physically, you can set a computer loose on doing a million ideas in an hour. And then you are selecting and adjusting parameters with your trained eye, you know, critical creativity, you're you know, thinking about beauty, you're thinking about utility. And, and that to me is um, wildly exciting because I think it, it, there's an exponential leap in um, the fidelity of how we design, but the complete compositional control and creative continuance from intent to execution. I, I find that fascinating. And I think it's, it's an important part of uh, the future of design is going to be this, no one's walking away from the analog. No one's walking away from craft. It's we have this sense of power that we've never had at our fingertips. The, the power of nature, thinking about generating from atoms into forms and surfaces, and then learning very quickly and adjusting. Let me ask you a question about, in a way, the other direction, which is maxing out the individual human creative critical uh, component. Um, and this is really a question about how Nike works with the artists and designers who are external to the company, the most famous example being Virgil Abloh. But I know you've also worked with Sam Ross, who's actually been on the uh, program, okay. Design and Dialogue, before. Um, and I wonder, uh, I guess, first of all, what your own role in those conversations is, whether it's more like handing over the keys or if it's, or if it's like you're driving down the road together. But then also what you feel um, comes into the company from those creative partners. You know, for... for 50 years, Glenn, you know, we, we've been a company who we, we hire designers and innovators and, and we hire the world's best and we're lucky we have a thousand creatives at the company. Um, but we've also been a company who has been interested in listening and hearing to new and other voices. And these voices come from different areas of the world, different cultures, different backgrounds. And it's not enough to think you can solve every problem by yourself. Um, so we invite uh, individual thinkers and designers that push and explore our own thinking. And I like to say that, you know, we meet as equals because we're together attacking a problem that neither one of us could do perfectly on our own. But together, it's the combination and the, the intensity of the study and, and the commitment to each other to find new ground, new space. Um, that has always been very interesting. Um, quick answer is we don't turn the keys over. No, no, this is a collaboration in every sense. And thinking about, you know, I, I saw Sam, uh, Sam Ross's piece here. I mean, I can tell you that we become friends because we're in this together. We are, we are designers and artists and we're all pushing in the same space. And there's a collegiality camaraderie of doing these things together. And when we find new ground, we feel great because they help open opportunities. They help open the aperture and the lens. I think vice versa uh, on all of our great collaborator spaces. Hmm. That's awesome. It's, it's really kind of inspiring to hear you talk about that and also talk about craft because, you know, if, if you come from a somewhat niche perspective as somebody who's working in avant-garde craft and design spaces, you might think that a company like Nike would just almost not even be aware of that kind of energy. But the fact that you're so proactively um, stepping into that world and really, as you say, meeting it on equal terms, I think is, is super exciting and, and uh, you know, fantastically inspirational in a lot of ways uh, to hear. Um, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a creative being, Glenn, so I, I, <laughs> most of my required job uh, skills are being a sponge and scanning the planet of, of what's coming. And so I, I have my hands in, my interest in lots of different disciplines all over the world. And, you know, people always ask me, well, how do you get inspired and where do ideas come from? And, you know, it, inspiration never presents itself as a fully functioned idea. It's an abstraction. And, and it's your job as a designer to connect the dots of that abstraction into something new, something that hasn't been done before. So 
again, having a, a bit of a, a disregard for the status quo, wanting to push against that, and then find these unique formulas and tendrils of the world, that's exciting. You know, when I think about putting people around the table in-house and out-of-house, um, and the goal being, hey, together, we're going to do something great. We're going to find something new. We're going to create new ground. That's exciting to me. That's so great. You know, it's so funny because I've done over a hundred of these interviews and I always try never to ask where do your ideas come from? Because I know it's such a cliche question, but that's actually a really good answer. <laughs> so I hope people out there are listening. Um, one last question, then I, I'm hoping Nick uh, might jump in with a question too, because I know Nick's been paying a lot of attention to this for past years and has, has a lot to say on the topic. Um, the last question I have is how do the athletes that you work with correlate to the other customers of Nike. And again, I'm sure this is something you're asked about a lot, but you're, you've talked a lot about super high tolerance, high performance inputs from those athletes, marathoners, et cetera. But of course, most of what Nike is actually selling is uh, going to people that are either, as I say, amateur athletes or non-athletes. And how do you think about that palette or that spectrum of use and the kind of design assets that you're putting out into the world? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, again, we've had a 50 year history of working with the world's best athletes and, and what they show us are the possibilities. They give us glimpses of the impossible of what our species can do, right? And so then we're their partner to understand the most minute problems that we can solve. And if we can solve it for an Olympic athlete, then we can cascade those learnings all the way down to um, a person who's just going for a walk. And so the benefit is innovation at the tip of the spear changes the game. And that's felt all the way down the, uh, I guess the value chain of, of people who are engaged in movement. So that if we can solve it up here, you're gonna get the benefit all the way down wherever you are. So it is, and we're not just solving elite athletes. We, we solve style and comfort and sustainability and it's, it, it's not only drafted down. This is kind of a, um, I guess, a tour de force approach of looking at all different problems that athletes face and how can we make their lives better? How can we make people enjoy sports more? How can we invite more to their greatness, to find their potential? We, we know and we've learned that um, people who move and people who participate in sports um, they, they, they push and they find, they find their greatness and they find potential as, as one outlet. You know, it reminds me a little bit of the space program and arguments that are made for preserving that kind of investment and exploration that, you know, a lot the, the learnings cascade down into other industries, other sectors and so on, um, which is, I, I think, very persuasive. Although it also strikes me that there's a, a very important way which might be growing over time for Nike that has to do with the ground up like I think about something like sustainability, which is actually not something where you're thinking so much in terms of you know Olympic athletes, because obviously there the quantities are going to be very small no matter what. It's you know the vast bulk of what Nike is putting out into the world, and so as you say, it's it's kind of uh, traveling multiple directions at once. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a mosaic of innovations, right? And the and the top of the mosaic is the, the Olympic athletes, but um, that to me would be about impact prospecting what is the biggest impact we can have it's in some cases it's one athlete getting out and going for a run and others it's solving some of the uh value chain industry issues of how we can be more sustainable that to me is really exciting you know innovation at nike is always a commitment and never a guarantee but we have so many problems that we can look at in that mosaic and we've got so many irons in the fire that we know we can keep progressing sports which is great and also progressing uh, the public and general culture at the same time. Well, last thing I'll say is it's also very inspiring to hear somebody talk about sustainability as an inspiring problem rather than a kind of soul crushing <laughs> one, you know, and just to be able to tackle something like that and say, okay, this is going to push us to innovate and push us to be better. That, that seems to me like the only possible way through that, that um, obviously massive existential problem that we're facing. Together as a I, again, I, I would say, you know, that our company is here to protect the future of sport, that we think sport is a birthright for every generation. And that is a part of the problem. You know, I, I, I'm quoted as saying, when I was trained as an architect, 
the, the adage was form follows function. And I don't think that's enough anymore, Glenn. I think form and function follow footprint. They have to. There is another constraint, utility, beauty, and sustainability. And, and that's another parameter, another constraint in the formula that makes us better. And we don't want to compromise. We want to have amazing products. And we want that product to be circular in, in nature. And we want to do the most good with the least material possible. Uh, I just don't believe that it's a, I don't believe it's a zero sum game. Awesome. Okay. Um, I just want to welcome Nick uh, Schoenberger onto the uh, program briefly, just to ask a couple of questions if you'd like to, Nick. Um, so Nick, again, is Senior Director of Narrative Storytelling, amazing title <laughs> at, at Nike, and has a kind of curatorial creative role in relation to the company's activities. So um, what are your thoughts, Nick, and about what you've heard and anything you'd like to ask John? Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Um, thank you, John, so much. Uh, Glenn, one thing that I keep thinking about is your query about Michael Graves and then John, your response, and then the through line to your your last statement um, for me is empathy. And I would hope that you could comment a little bit about the ingredient of empathy in design uh, and when you begin to reconcile it as an important um, component to considering what is essentially one of the greatest client relationships. We looked at falling water, we looked at tabletops, we looked at hotels and we've gone through um, you know, Nike's fine history and all of that is really finding form and function and to your point now footprint, uh, but also finding an empathetic uh, connection to the end user. Uh, and I wondered, um, again, if you could comment a little bit about discovery of the role of empathy as an ingredient or a component to design in your career. Yeah, certainly. It, it, um, I just, I've just always, I've always uh, talked about there are creative impacts that happen in the world and, and creative paths in the world. And there's the artist's path. And, the, the, and this is not negative or positive. The, the artist's path uses creativity to explore and express problems from within uh, to serve their personal uh, perspective. And a designer is not that. A designer has a larger social contract and that's rooted in empathy. You're, you're using your creative impact through a social contract to explore and express and solve problems for other people, which means you suspend your own perspective and you, you deploy your creative skills and your craft towards wanting to solve other people's problems. And that doesn't mean it, it's devoid of personality, it's devoid of, uh, of, of beauty, of, of the hand of the maker. It means that the origin of it is somebody else. <laughs> and you know, Nike and, and Nike design is all about empathy. We have to, because we're, we're trying to progress the world of athletics, make their life more comfortable, easier, more contained, uh, et cetera. You know, I, I, I'm a big believer that um, empathy is our advantage at the company because uh, we're here to solve problems, whatever the problems are. And the problems will change and shift over time. Certainly this past year has shown us this. Um, I'm also fond of saying that, you know, the, at the end of the day, when we deploy empathy and utility and beauty, that the goal should be goosebumps, that the product that we create elicits a response emotionally, physically, viscerally that says, I didn't know I needed that. That is amazing. That is magic. That is beautiful. That is audaciously imaginative. It's pushing me someplace new. And we have the history of doing that, of putting these things out into the world that change permanently the trajectory of products and sports. And it's all rooted in empathy. That's great, John. Um, Nick, do you have any last questions before we uh, sign off? I know that John knows that I have endless questions for him. I feel like that is the place to end today. It is a great place to end, indeed. Um, well, Nick, thank you for uh, hopping on. And John, what can I say, man? It's been a great conversation. So fantastic to have this opportunity to touch base with you and hear about your history, history of the company.
any of the ideas you've been working with and the ideas you're going to be putting out into the world in the future. So thank you so much for being on the show. Well, it's uh, my my absolute pleasure, and um, and thank you so much for having me on your your podcast. Um, I believe design is here to make a big impact, and um, we've only just begun. Well, amen to that. We, we believe in that <laughs> very seriously, too. Uh, so uh, thanks again for uh, tuning in this week. We'll be back live again next week with another episode of Design and Dialogue. So come on back next Wednesday. And John, thanks again. Have a great day. Thanks, Brian. Okay, bye.